All right. Otto, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Three, two, one. Let's jam. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein, and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In today's episode, I speak with Otto von Hamer, Director of Core Strategies at MAN AHL. After briefly touching upon Otto's background, we dive into one of his most popular papers, The Best Strategies for Inflationary Times. Otto shares the inspiration for the research as well as some of what he feels are the less obvious results. Trend strategies, which were a standout winner in the inflation resilience horse race, serve as the bridge to a discussion on seasonality. Interestingly, Otto's research suggests that long-term trend signals are actually capturing seasonality effects. Otto shares his thoughts on different approaches to measuring seasonality, why he believes seasonality emerges in both commodities and financial markets, and how to think about combining trend and seasonality in a single portfolio. Please enjoy my conversation with Otto von Hamer. Otto, welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Corey. Pleasure to be here. So let's just dive right in at the beginning of your career. You were an academic for a little bit, but you really started your post-academic career right in the throes of the 2008 financial crisis, which maybe in hindsight was the best or worst time to start your career. But you mentioned to me that this experience of when you started really shaped your view on quantitative value investing. And I was hoping you could maybe expand on that. What is your view on quantitative value and how did 2008 really end up informing that view? Yeah, so I started in August 2008, which is indeed a very interesting time to start just before Lehman collapsed and the global financial crisis was at its worst. What I noticed pretty quickly is that some models were not just losing money at that time, but were losing money for reasons that were remarkable. There were models, and in particular the value models that you mentioned, that just didn't make that much sense anymore in a new environment. I'll give you an example. We were trading value-oriented models for CMBX and ABX, the synthetic credit indices for commercial and subprime real estate. And these models typically pointed to a value opportunity when the price goes below par, goes to 98, 97. It was screaming a buy opportunity at that stage. But of course, they were simply missing how much the world had changed and prices didn't rebound from 98 back to 100. No, prices went from 98 to 95, to 90, to 80, to 70, to 60, and the value model kept being max long. It just was oblivious to what was happening and losing its shirts, essentially catching a falling knife, as they say. So value models have the risk that they're simply not suited for a new environment. They're not prepared for it. They're missing relevant new dynamics in the markets, and you run the risk of losing a lot. So... What that set off is a thought process of what are you good at when you're a systematic manager? Because I noticed at the same time that discretionary value-oriented investors were quick to pick up that the environment changed and stopped trading based on their old models. So I thought to myself, but as a systematic investor, surely I have an edge in some cases as well. And the answer I came up with is that you need to trade things that are truly more constant over time, truly repeating over time, so that a systematic rule that you historically test makes sense. And ultimately, I answered that question as behavioral signals are the most promising for a systematic approach, because behavior in the end is the thing that stays constant. Humans don't change their behavior and therefore 
any pattern that is more closely linked to behavioral biases is more likely to persist even through different times that you may encounter. So I soured a bit early on already on value type models and started focusing more on models that I would call behavioral in nature. I would say that souring on value in many ways is in stark contrast to broad quant orthodoxy. If we look at some of, not the biggest quant firms, but many of the most public quant firms, they have a strong value foundation, if not outright bias. You talked a little bit about there, but I was hoping to draw out maybe a little further what you sort of think the biggest wedge between your beliefs on value are versus the community at large. For example, are you more skeptical about the returns or are you more skeptical about the role that value can play within a portfolio? Or are you just skeptical that value can be done in a systematic manner in the first place? It's mostly the latter. So to be sure, I do believe ultimately value is a sensible concept. Securities can be underpriced, they can be overpriced, but I do believe discretionary managers may be better at factoring in the current environment, while systematic managers need a certain amount of history in order to test the rules that they apply. So indeed, I think it's hard for a systematic investor to capture value. What ends up happening often is that you're missing certain aspects of value. So you have a misspecified model. But what can also happen is that, yes, you have a decent enough proxy for value and you systematically determine if a security is under or overpriced, but then you still need to get the timing right. There is, of course, this well-known saying that markets stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent by Keynes, and that very much applies as well. So not only do you need a good enough proxy for value where possibly the world has changed and you need to factor in more recent considerations, but also you need to get the timing right. So it's a tough one. I don't say it cannot be done in a systematic fashion, but for me, there are more promising situations where you can apply systematic rules and benefit from that. So I personally like to specialize on the more promising area for systematic trading, which are plenty. I just don't include value as much in that. Well, I think that segues nicely into where I wanted to go next, because after a couple of years, you left your first role and joined IMC with a blank slate to start a new systematic macro fund. In our pre-call, you said that one of the key questions you asked yourself in designing the fund and architecting the strategy that would ultimately support the fund was this question of, quote, what do I think I can be good at knowing when there are many other people who trade these markets? And I really love that question. I think it's a really foundational question for anyone who enters markets, particularly markets that have a tremendous amount of volume and are traded by many, many, many thousands of people around the world. How did you answer that question? Yeah, so I look for situations where I truly believe patterns repeat over time, linked to behaviors or linked to certain institutional features that I know are constant enough to be amenable to a systematic approach to exploit it. So for example, I started focusing a lot on more calendar related patterns where I know towards the end of the month, certain institutions may rebalance their portfolios back to a certain asset mix, or they may reset their currency hedges, and they do it like clockwork. They do it on a particular day, usually towards the end of the month, and they do it irrespective of price moves. That's just the trade they need to be done, and a lot of capital follows the same type of pattern. Those are ideal situations for me, because there's a real repetitiveness to it, it's been going on for a long time in the past. So any rule you can come up with can be tested over a sufficient amount of historical data. But also going forward, those institutions will continue to do those same actions in the same part of the month. And the calendar itself is not changing either. So it gives you the stability of the pattern in order to be very well suited for a systematic approach. And I started really specializing in these type of patterns, sometimes calendar related, sometimes different, but really where I believe there's an identifiable human behavior and institutional friction that you can point to when you design the model. I know that we have a number of listeners who hope to one day 
start their own fund. If you could rewind the clock and give a younger auto advice about starting a new systematic macro fund, what advice would you give yourself? Maybe I'll give you one on the investment strategy and one more on everything around it. But first on the investment strategy itself, I focused a lot on what new models you can come up with, what new patterns you can come up with that are exploitable by your systematic trading rules. Obviously, I did have risk management in place, but I think I would advise a person in a similar situation to think even more about what limits to risk do you want to set? What drawdown controls do you want to put in place? What conditions would you say are such that you should stop trading a model? So really think a lot about what can go wrong and how you would respond to that and where possible codify that. That's something that I think I could have done more of in that position I had at IMC back in the day. And it is something that subsequently, when I joined AHL, was really at the forefront of people that work at AHL. And it's that relentless risk management aspect of the job that really, after joining AHL, was something I became more and more familiar with. So that's on the investment strategy side. Maybe a comment on the structuring around it. I would say when you set up a fund from scratch, as we did back in the day, and you have financial backers making possible that whole effort, you cannot be clear and transparent enough. And I think also there are some lessons to be learned. Talk through with the people that support you, what type of return profile you believe will come out of your strategies, what type of setbacks you may face, so that no one is surprised when those things inevitably at some point happen. So I feel that Maybe we had not discussed enough between the financial backers and myself, all the scenarios, and therefore at times we're surprised when we hit a certain stumbling block. So talking over all the different paths that you may encounter is something I would advise people to do. Now, you're not just a practitioner. You are also a prolific researcher and writer, and you are co-author of two papers that are in the, I think it's the top 100 most downloaded on SSRN, which is a very impressive feat. And I know your most downloaded paper, which is titled The Best Strategies for Inflationary Times, has certainly made the rounds. I think it's hit my desk a number of times circulating around. I want to know what was the motivation behind the research to that incredibly popular paper? And from your perspective, what were some of the less obvious results that you found? Yeah, thanks for well having the paper on your desk by the sound of it, but maybe for the benefit of the listeners. So SSRN is a working paper outlet. There's more than a million papers posted there. And so top 100 means top 0.01%. So it truly means that only papers that are on a topic that is popular make it. And that kind of tells you a little bit what type of papers I try to write. I try to think through what is going to be an important theme going forward and what is the best I can say about that particular topic. So the first one was actually back in 2007 when I wrote about the subprime mortgage crisis and had a detailed empirical analysis into that. And that turned out to be an early paper because in 2008, a year later, the crisis around subprime mortgages really unfolded. And then the one you just mentioned on inflation, we put out the paper in March 2001, which again was a bit ahead of the big inflation spike we saw in the one and two years after that. So again, the first issues around inflation were already bubbling up, perhaps at the start of 2021. But then we just decided, let's do the work. Let's get data back as far as we can, which meant almost 100 years. Let's do that for three regions across the world, the US, the UK and Japan. And let's just ask ourselves the question, when inflation rises, what assets, what investments, both active and passive, what investments do well and what investments do badly when you have such a rising inflationary environment. And it's funny, some of the results we found back again at the start of 2021 were debated, but are by now accepted and almost obvious when I mention them. For example, the first thing we illustrated is that Long bonds and long equities are type of positions that are really hurt when there's an inflation spike. In case of bonds, that is in fact quite obvious. Bonds don't respond well to rising inflation. 
In case of stocks, it was debated a lot because companies in principle can try to pass through higher prices to their customers and be fine. But the reality is they're not because when inflation rises, it typically means the economy is in a much worse state because there's a rate hiking cycle that follows rising inflation that really cools down the economy. So stocks in the end do badly as well when inflation rises. And that's very obvious to people now, seem to be a little less obvious, but still clearly in the data when we typed up that first paper. The other one is on commodities. We made the point that commodities tend to be really robust during inflationary spikes, perform really well, in particular at the start of inflationary spikes. That too was debated. It was in the data, in particular in the 70s, commodities did very well when inflation spiked. But then people would say that's because there were crises related to oil itself, and therefore it was a special time period that would not repeat itself. We did, however, the analysis, more than 100 years of data, and we found that outside of the 70s, the same result held. Commodities simply do benefit from inflationary pressures. And so that was clearly in the data, something we typed up, and again, something that really played out that way. So they were results that were clearly in the data. It wasn't a particularly difficult analysis outside of getting all the data and just diligently going through all the different asset classes and being very precise about what time period you count as inflation and doing the accounting of when performance is good, when performance is bad for certain investments. And the data spoke for itself. Results were very clear cut. And all we did was structure that into a paper and put it out, I guess, in retrospect, with good timing. I would say almost perfect timing. Well, inflation is, at least to me, one of these catch-all terms. And inflation can have a variety of causal sources ranging from supply shocks to demand shocks, even to monetary debasement, some of which can have global effects, some of which can have local effects. Historically in the data, things that might have global effects today might have historically had local effects. How do you think about building a generically inflation resilient portfolio, given all these potential different drivers that could change headline inflation numbers? So the origin of an inflation spike can vary a lot from one episode to another. But the similarity really comes in the subsequent market moves. And that's what we illustrated in the paper we just mentioned. So it's the same actually with equity sell-offs. The origin of an equity sell-off can be quite unique every time, but subsequent behavior in markets shows a lot of parallels. So when we think about what is a robust investment portfolio, robust also to more inflationary times, it's really not adding hedges to it or always betting against inflation. It's really about finding a mix of investments that does well also when inflation rises. So commodities is a good example of an asset that you would want to add into the mix. But also the behavior following perhaps a more unique instigator for inflation or a unique instigator of uh, equity sell of time period. The next effect in markets is often one that is things going from bad to worse. First, one area gets impacted, then the next one, and there's a certain cascading effect. And that type of behavior really plays to the strength of one particular strategy, that is the trend following, the time series, macro futures, trend following type strategy. That really exploits the fact that things may start in a small way in a couple of markets, but in the end, cascade into other markets and longer trends play out. You saw exactly this happening again during the inflationary time period we had in 2022. You see it often during equity crises. So unique origins to a crisis or an inflation spike, but subsequent market moves have this cascading nature to it that plays to the strength of trend following in particular. So other than just adding commodities as a diversifier to your mix, trends helps during those more stressful times as either the inflation or equity sell-off time periods. Now, I would argue that inflation is a compensated risk factor. So with that in mind, talking about these different asset classes that might help make a portfolio more robust to inflation, 
How do you think about the idea of building something that's resilient to inflation without completely eroding that risk premium to zero? Is this a risk that we have to tolerate within a portfolio? Yeah, so our approach hasn't been one where you would always hedge out inflation risk. Indeed, I would say it's a price risk factor. Long-term nominal bonds tend to, on average, have a higher yield than short-term nominal bonds, which may be a reflection of a compensation for inflation risk that impacts long-term nominal bonds more. So our approach isn't to always hedge out that risk. Our approach would be to, as mentioned, add some elements to your portfolio that are more robust to inflation, either commodities or, say, trend, as an example. Another approach that we also take is more actively risk managing the positions you hold, which can mean reducing risk in assets that become very volatile or are losing a lot of money in the face of an inflationary shock. So having tight risk controls around your positions, even around your long only positions, is another way to deal with a plethora of risks, but that includes inflation. And then the final one is you can actually try to actively time inflation as well. Some securities are very inflation sensitive. You may have a number of those securities that are inflation sensitive and kind of as a voting mechanism, look at the average reading you get from those markets and then act on it and lower the exposure to inflation sensitive securities when those markets point to a a more inflationary environment. So you can diversify your portfolio, you can risk control your portfolio, and you can more explicitly try to exploit variations in inflationary pressure. So there's a couple of ways you can deal with it, but none of them is explicitly always hedging out inflation, as then, as you pointed out, you're just paying the risk premium that's associated with that particular source of risk. I want to use another one of your papers as a bridge to talk about this concept of seasonality, which you started to touch upon a little bit earlier in the podcast. And you wrote this paper called Trend Following, Equity, Bond, and Crisis Alpha, where you studied trend following. And one of the interesting things that you argued within this paper was that short-term lags might actually pick up on investor under behavior and sort of arguably be a behavioral premium, whereas longer-term trend lags may actually be seasonality effects. It might not be trend at all. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what seasonality effects are and why you think they are distinct from existing factors like trend. Yeah. So in that particular paper, we tested how predictive are previous returns for the coming month's return. And if you look at the previous one or two or three month returns, that clearly is a trend type signal. You just simply go in the same direction as the returns were in the previous months for a security. It turns out when you do that analysis and you ask yourself, at what lag are returns still predictable for the next month? It turns out the answer is 12 months. Up to 12 months ago, the return is still predictive with a positive sign for the next month's return, but then month 13, 14, 15, not anymore. In fact, the sign flips. This in some ways shouldn't surprise us in the stock factor literature, cross-sectional stock momentum usually goes up to 12 months. You don't see a nine month momentum signal or a 15 month momentum signal. It's always 12 months. There's something special about the 12 month window and there is, and this is what I will then refer to as a seasonality. It also turns out that if you try to predict the next month's return with an intermediate lag, say six or seven months ago, there's not as much evidence. So really the evidence of predictability in the same direction as previous returns is kind of in two parts. It's the most recent couple of months that is predictive for the next month, which is again, a medium term trend signal, or you have to go all the way back to almost a year ago. And that's almost equally predictive as we illustrate in that paper. This was quite counterintuitive to people when they first saw it, because literally it means that if today it's March now, and you want to predict the returns over March, April, May, then really what I say is what you can do is go back almost a year ago and look at the returns previous year, April, previous year, May, previous year, June, And those returns 
are predictive with a positive sign for the returns you are going to experience over the next one or two months. That to people is way less intuitive than to say there's short-term momentum or medium-term momentum in returns and therefore use only the most recent months to predict. So you end up with a pattern that's very clearly in the data across asset classes illustrated in our work since 1960, more than half a century. Other people have hinted at this pattern as well. And again, 12-month momentum in the stock factor literature is obviously disgusting as well. But you end up with a seasonality and a medium-term trend pattern that are really quite distinct because the lags that are kind of in between those two are not as pronounced. And the seasonality one is much less embraced and believed by people, even though the empirical evidence is as strong, which in some ways is a great situation. Fewer people believe it, but it's still as strong and as clearly in the data, then we are happy to trade on it and are happy for others to not trade as much on it. There seem to be three big categories of seasonality trades. And the first are these, what we call fixed calendar trades, such as the concept of sell in May and go away. And then the second are maybe what you were referring to a little bit in your last answer, which were more rolling window effects. So you might say, well, how did equities do in June over the last 10 years? Let's just look at June and see, did it do well in June? And then finally, there are some of these like event-based trades where they happen on a calendar basis, but they actually move in the calendar. And I'm thinking of things like options expiration or Fed announcements or even earnings calendars. Curious how you would rank these approaches from most effective to least and why? Yeah, so we focused mostly on the rolling effects, as you call it. And the one I just described is of that type. You look at rolling windows and go back almost a year ago, or you do that over a number of cycles. So you go back the previous 10 years and look at the month that is about to start. So if we're now in March, you look at the April return but not just of last year, but also the years before to get a sense of what is the performance in April, given that we're about to enter April in half a month, and we then take that position. Those rolling formulations have proven to be most robust for us. They are also formulations that need least manual setting of parameters. All you need to say is, what is the cycle length that I believe in most? And annual cycles is an obvious one and a very powerful one. And also such rolling formulations can be applied across a wide range of securities. You just simply apply the same specification on the different markets, and it will learn from its own market history when to go long, when to go short in security. So they are the the most favorite with me, at least. You mentioned fixed timing calendar effects. So the most famous, I think, is the Halloween effect or the sell in May effect, as it's also called. In general, the fixed calendar effects, I think, are a bit less robust. So I'm not as keen on it. Now, the Halloween effect itself actually has been remarkably robust, I should admit. So the sell in May and go away and then buy back into stocks around Halloween time has, in fact, done all right over the most recent years. But there's many fixed calendar effects that have not been as robust. So all in all, the collective evidence, at least on these type of patterns, I don't think is as palatable as it is on the rolling window formulations. And then the third and final category you mentioned on event-based effects, they're a bit trickier to exploit because you take positions only around particular events. So that really means that you need to take punchy positions at those times because you'll have zero positions at other times. So it has a very spiky, unfavorable risk-taking profile if you seek to exploit those event-based models. The other is that over time, people may start anticipating certain events and the exact timing shifts a little bit forward or backward of when people act on the events. And then you don't automatically have a mechanism to adapt to that. While as with those rolling window seasonality formulations, the rolling window at some point will just adapt to any slight change in timing and will just calibrate to the new timing automatically. And event models don't have that feature. So you asked me about a ranking. I would rank the rolling window seasonality models the highest and then fixed timing and then event-based, I suppose. 
commodity markets seem to have strong seasonal patterns that are intrinsic to the nature of many commodities themselves. So for example, weather patterns, harvest periods, the needs of producers and consumers, the hedge during different seasonal times, all those features could lead to the emergence of seasonal risk premia, in my opinion. But I'm not sure I could comfortably say that the same is true for more financial assets like stocks or bonds or even currencies. Do you think there's a clear rationale as to why seasonality emerges in some of these other asset classes? I think seasonality emerges at all the logical frequencies at which we act and trade in markets. The annual frequency is a important frequency. We do typically do annual reporting. We do typically have annual taxing cycles. There's a lot of things that happen on an annual basis, not just the weather that may most directly impact commodities. So simply humans to a degree operating on an annual cycle, I believe will lead to predictable price pressures at annual frequencies. And those are not just exploitable in commodities, but also in other macro markets. On top of that, the annual cycle is not the only cycle that matters. We do things also on a monthly or a quarterly basis, for example. On a monthly basis, many people get their salaries on a monthly basis. And pension plans and corporations that pay salaries and pension payments, they may go through the same cycle every month of unwinding some of their book, going into cash, paying it out to the people that get those payments, who then may reinvest in markets again. So there's a clear monthly cycle relevant to markets as well as quarterly cycles when, for example, resetting of currency hedges may happen quarterly cycle length as well. So I believe it's at all the logical frequencies that people act and therefore also act in financial markets and therefore flow to a degree is predictable and exploitable at monthly, quarterly, annual cycles. And it's surely not confined to commodities, in my view. Do you think in different markets, the opportunity represents a risk premium, say, in some markets versus a behavioral anomaly in other markets? If a risk factor has a seasonal component to it, then a seasonality signal will naturally pick up on that as well. So to some degree, seasonality type models can be a partially capturing a risk premium to the extent that there's seasonal aspects to different risk premia. It's also in that regard important to mention that even though seasonality uses historical prices and typically historical prices and returns with a positive sign to predict future returns, it's very different from trend. And in particular, it does not have the kind of crisis alpha feature that trend, I believe, enjoys. So you do have to be careful with seasonality models. It's not a natural crisis alpha signal. And to a degree, it may be compensation for risk because those risk factors may have seasonal aspects to it. So it's a powerful model in terms of alpha source, I believe, but one has to carefully risk manage. One of the arguments I've heard against seasonality is that, particularly with the rolling window effects, that it can suffer from this low sample size issue. So I think the example we used earlier is it's March, we're looking towards April, we might ask, how did equities perform in April over the last 10 years. And with just n equals 10, that seems like a pretty low sample size to try to estimate in effect. How would you either address this problem numerically, or how would you address this pushback on the significance of seasonality effects? So in your example, it's now March, and you look at the previous 10 Aprils in order to get the direction on a particular security. So that uses 10 months worth of returns in order to determine your direction. If you look, for example, at three-month trend strategies, it only uses the past three months to determine your directionality. So in some ways, you're already using more data with the previous 10 Aprils than just the previous three months. And ultimately, why I believe you still have enough data in order to say something and do something sensible is that you can apply this rule to a very broad range of assets, just like trends can be applied to a very broad range of assets. So your statistical power to a large degree comes from the large number of securities that you apply the concept to 
more than that for any individual security, you have a very strong signal. When you look at something like seasonality, is this a trade that's best applied in the cross section or is this best applied as a time series trade? I've seen implementations of both types. Ultimately, it's a question of whether the market itself, which you would hedge out or neutralize to in a cross-sectional setting, the question is if the market itself has that same seasonal pattern or not. But I've seen implementations of both types and both types seem palatable to me. Given your research that longer term lags measured by some trend models may actually be seasonality effects, how do you think about combining seasonality and trend within a single portfolio? The first thing to realize is a point I briefly alluded to before, and that is that the risk characteristics of trend are a bit different from the risk characteristics of seasonality. Trend does have this crisis alpha feature in that it tends to do well during equity market sell-offs. Seasonality doesn't necessarily have that feature. So it may be a good standalone alpha source. It may not correlate much to the market, but it doesn't necessarily have that crisis alpha feature. So you should ask yourself to what extent you're investing in futures just to get that crisis alpha feature or just to get the maximum alpha you can obtain. The second is when you trade Two different models, in this case, trends and seasonality. If you trade two different models on the same set of markets, then at times they will mostly line up. So at times your seasonality signals may be mostly risk on, your trend signals may be mostly risk on as well, and you're kind of doubling up on a particular risk. So you do have to think through carefully to what extent you're comfortable with that or whether you cap the risk of the combined view of the two or more models that you employ. So that's another important consideration when you put together different models that ultimately operate on the same markets. You need to factor in alignment of risk and how you manage that risk when that happens. We talked a little bit about this idea of seasonal risk premia and risk premia changes that can be picked up by seasonality. And it strikes me that another factor that might capture some of the same idea might be carry. That if we saw a change in seasonal risk premia, it might show up in the term structure of futures and carry signals might capture very similar effects. Do you see any overlap with seasonality and carry? Some, not as much, but to the degree carry is defined in a way that it's allowed to be somewhat seasonal. You can explicitly correct for it, and then it's not. But some formulations of carry have a seasonal component to it. It can start having some correlation with seasonality models, but it's not a very high correlation. Ultimately, there are distinct patterns in my view. We mentioned earlier that you are a prolific researcher. We only talked about two of your papers, but I was hoping maybe you could look back at the breadth of papers that you've authored and co-authored and Share some other ways in which lessons from this published research has ultimately ended up influencing strategy or portfolio design. One paper we wrote called The Best of Strategies for the Worst of Times, it really was an effort where we talked to many people, mostly internal to Mangrove, and we asked them, what type of strategies do you think are defensive? What would you say is a good investment when you're concerned about an equity sell-off? And we got a lot of suggestions and we simply did the work. We tested it. We tested it over long histories. We were very precise about what we mean with being defensive. We defined exactly time periods over which equity markets had a major sell-off. And we measured to the day whether those suggested strategies turned out to be helpful and actually make you money during those equity sell-off time periods. And so that was a very fun exercise. It involved working with a lot of different people and just testing it all and figure out which ones stood up to scrutiny. What we found is that other than trend that we kind of knew already would be good in terms of this defensive characteristic, other than trend, the one that really stood out was quality. So you go long, high quality stocks and short, low quality stocks. So long, short quality type factor that really worked out well during crises as well. And in fact, wasn't that correlated to trends because it behaves very differently. Trends on average does well during equity sell-offs, but it needs a bit of time. So it needs 
an equity sell of that is not instantaneous. It needs an equity sell of that builds and then gets from bad to worse. And the trend follower picks up on that and benefits from it. Quality is very different, in particular, if you look at profitability type definitions that are usually part of the broader quality framework. Profitability is a more static accounting type variable where you have the accounting profitability over the, say, accounting book value of a company, and it has more a sit and wait for the crisis feature. It is just all the time, long to high quality, short to low quality companies. And when then stress hits the market, even if it's a gap move or a quick move, it on average tends to have the right position and immediately benefit from that. So we found out that that's is just a really nice complement to trend. Both are quite defensive, but we also had to recognize that quality is a bit of a term that is used for many individual specifications of what falls under the quality umbrella. And we tested component by component what actually is more defensive or less defensive within the quality umbrella. And we found, for example, that something like the low beta factor is sometimes included in the quality definition. Low beta at times really is not that defensive, in particular when there's tightening funding and credit conditions, low beta type factors may not do as well. While as low idiosyncratic volatility factors that conceptually seem linked, but they behave very differently and they are in fact much more defensive and not suffering as much from tightening funding conditions. So even though quality is a broad concept, really held up nicely, the devil is in the details and certain aspects work much better than others. And a bit of a long winded story to your question, what else have we learned that we put into practice? Well, we did then on the back of those insights, start a more quality oriented strategy that's really meant to be a complement to trend following. And that was really following the principles that we laid bare in that particular paper. So that's something concretely that we started implementing as well on the back of the more academic type paper that we wrote on the topic. I want to return to that core question that you asked yourself a little over a decade ago. What do I think I can be good at knowing when there are many other people who trade these markets? Curious how you answer that question today in your seat at Man AHL, and how does that answer differ from when you originally asked yourself over a decade ago? So I'd say it's still my core belief that systematic investing has a comparable advantage when it comes to exploiting recurring behavioral patterns as human behavior is is persistent and therefore is suitable to a rules-based approach that you test on long histories of data. Also, systematic investing is very well suited for types of patterns that play out in a broad range of securities. So you really have the statistical power to test a concept because you can apply it across many different securities. You can look at the historical performance when trading it on all those securities. And also, once you codify a particular trading strategy, you can easily apply it in many markets, much better than perhaps a more discretionary trader would do. So it's my belief that human biases playing out in many different markets, those things really play to the strength of a systematic investor. And maybe newer insights, newer in the sense that I've been much more attuned to it since I joined HL compared to previous places I was at. Newer insights are mostly around the risk management aspect. It's one thing to have a number of models that on average tend to work over time. It's another thing to live through ups and downs of that and to decide which ones to continue with and which ones to discontinue when they underwhelm. So the proactive risk management aspect around either active strategies or even long-only investments one may do is something that's been a much bigger focus of me in the most recent years and something that, yeah, was added, I guess, to my experience set more since I joined ASL. Lotto, we've come to the end of the episode, and I just have one last question for you. It's the same question I'm asking every guest this season, which is, what are you most passionate about today? It can be something within the world of finance. It could be something culturally, a book, a show, a movie, or just something outside those realms that you particularly really care about? It may be a slight cliche, but I'm really 
excited that the world does seem to go through a bit of a technological revolution at the moment. Generative AI has a lot of promise. At the same time, I don't think we have gotten even close of finding out exactly how to use it. And therefore, we're now going through that process where we're finding out how do we use it? Where does it make most sense? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? What type of new jobs will be created? What type of jobs are less relevant with it? So I think we're currently going through a very exciting phase. And it's very exciting to see that through the lens of an asset manager hedge fund that has many opportunities related to generative AI as well. Couldn't agree more. Tough space to stay on top of. Any tips or tricks on ways in which you're trying to stay on top of the speed of evolution in that space? One thing we did is we really wanted to get the overview at some point. So we had what we call an academic advisory board. We have that almost every year where we have a couple of leading academics plus the experts internally on the topic. And in this case, the topic was generative AI. And we really try to take stock. What do we now know? What are the different applications? As you may expect from us, we did ultimately type it up in a more than 100 page paper that was posted on SSRN by a colleague, I should say, not by me personally. And we felt at that stage, at least we know what had been done up until then. Of course, three months later, it's outdated and new things have developed, but we really just put in a lot of effort, staying abreast of the developments, knowing what's out there and trying to think through how can we use it in the most effective way. Well, Otto, thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. Thanks, Corey. It was a pleasure.